The B-36, Peacemaker, America's newest and largest bomber. It had the range to fly to Moscow and back without refueling. They had just made the turn near Soviet airspace and were heading back to the base. In the distance, they caught sight of something approaching fast. MiG-15s, and they didn't look friendly. This would be easy pickings for them. Four B-36s with no escort? Like shooting fish in a barrel. The MiGs flew by at close range just to rattle the B-36s before they turned back and prepared for a high-speed attack run. They closed in on the bombers, but what was that? Something was being lowered from their bomb bays. These weren't regular bombers. They had a host of parasite fighters. The goblins dropped from their motherships and swarmed towards the MiGs. They were outnumbered and had never faced these new fighters before. The MiGs called off, returning to Soviet airspace. The little goblins had won the day. Nineteen forty seven. The Convair B thirty six Peacemaker was in the final stages of design. Set to enter service in nineteen forty eight, this World War II era design bomber was to fulfill the role of primary nuclear weapons delivery vehicle for the Strategic Air Command. Its colossal size dwarfed anything that had come before it. The 40,000 kilogram payload was even larger than its successor, the Boeing B-52 Strato Fortress. This monster of the skies had the range to fly to Moscow and back without refueling, its maximum range being 16,000 kilometers. The B-36 had a relatively short-lived service life as it was rendered obsolete by the jet age it had been designed before the onset of the jet engine and the Soviet introduction of the MiG-15 jet, whereupon propeller-driven bombers became easy targets. This lesson was being played out on both sides of the developing Cold War. The Soviets and the Americans were entering an arms race, and air dominance was vital. The Germans had shown earlier in World War II that the future of air superiority rested on jet propulsion with the ME-262. These jet-powered planes flew much faster than their propeller counterparts, giving the pilots a huge advantage. Advancements in air technology in the West and East were heavily focused on this new form of propulsion. There was a downside, though. With this increase in power and speed came a higher demand for fuel. These new jet-powered aircraft had a shorter range than their propeller brethren. With the enormous range of the propeller-driven B-36, America now had a new problem on the horizon. On one hand, they had a heavy, nuclear-capable bomber able to reach into the heart of the USSR. But how could it defend itself? What was the use of a deep-range bomber if it couldn't survive the trip? During World War II, bombers had escorts of fighters, but also had to defend themselves. Turrets were the standard solution, but they were built for a different era. A relatively slow propeller fighter could be tracked and shot upon with the turrets. But what happens when you go up against a jet at much higher speeds? The bomber's turrets simply couldn't keep up, leaving the bomber undefended. At the time, two options existed. The first, and the one we use most often today, aerial refueling. Since the bombers were no longer fast enough to defend against enemy jets, they would need an escort. With a flying fuel tanker refueling these jets along the mission, they could repel any enemy attacks. The only problem though? Aerial refueling had not yet come of age. Though tested and under development, it was still far too dangerous to be used safely and reliably. This left only one other option, the flying aircraft carrier. Part of these carriers were parasite fighters. Parasite fighters were airplanes attached to or carried by the bomber that could be deployed at a moment's notice. There are essentially four ways to transport another plane. 
on its back, such as the modified 747s used by NASA's space shuttle orbiters. Underneath the belly of the plane, which was rejected by the Air Force due to concerns of increased drag. On the wings, such as in Project Tiptoe and TomTom. Tom. Or inside the bomb bays. Using existing fighters had been mostly ruled out due to technical concerns. The Air Force needed something of the jet age, something fresh, original, and designed with the limitations of the B-36 in mind. The McDonnell XF-85 Goblin. The Flying Ig, as it became known as, was the brainchild of Herman D. Barkey, better known for having designed the F-4 Phantom. Keeping in line with founder James McDonnell's supernatural naming provisions, like Banshee and Phantom, the potato-shaped aircraft was amiably named the Goblin. It came with foldable wings to allow it to fit within the B-36, had a length of less than 4.5 meters, a wingspan of 6.4 meters, and a height of 2.5 meters. Its empty weight was 1,700 kilos, with a maximum takeoff weight of 2,540 kilos. Well, maximum dropping weight, really. It had an estimated top speed of 1,050 kilometers an hour and an endurance of one hour and 20 minutes, though in actual use, it was closer to 30 minutes. It had a ceiling of 15,000 meters and was powered by a single Westinghouse XJ-34 WE-22 turbojet engine, providing 3,000 pounds of thrust. It also carried four Browning M3 50 caliber machine guns. Besides its potato-shaped fuselage, another unique part was its three-forked vertical stabilizers and docking hook. The hook was the real magic trick up the goblin's sleeve. You see, this parasite fighter wasn't meant to launch from its carrier and once its mission was completed, to land. It was meant to hook back up with its mothership to continue on mission. The Goblin was held within the bomb bay, and once ready for deployment, an intricate scaffolding and trapeze system would lower the Goblin into the airstream. It would then unfold its wings and air start its engine. The pilot would then release from the front scaffolding, and then gently lift off the trapeze and stow its hook. When he was ready to dock, the Goblin would again extend its hook and mate with the trapeze. After, he would fold his wings and turn off the engine. Once sufficiently cool, the bomber would raise and stow the Goblin back in the bomb bay. Two prototype Goblins were ordered in October of 1945, with testing to begin in June 1948. The first Goblin had been dropped and severely damaged during wind tunnel testing, leaving only the second one available for real-world flights. Since the B-36 wasn't yet ready, the diminutive Goblin was attached to a modified B-29 Super Fortress, nicknamed Monstro. The first five test flights were captive, the Goblin being lowered into the airstream for the pilot to get a feel for the aircraft and run basic tests, but never detaching. The elaborate and well-designed trapeze system was also used for the first time to see the aerodynamic effect it would have on both planes. The tests went well, and pilot Edwin Schock was ready for a real flight. On August 23, 1948, the Goblin would have its day. As Schock released the plane from the trapeze, it began to oscillate violently. He managed to regain control, but not before his flight suit was torn. The test continued for another 10 minutes without drama, until it came time to redock. As Shock approached the much larger bomber, the draft from it created turbulence for the tiny fighter. That and an air cushion had formed between the two aircraft, leading to difficulties reaching the trapeze. The test pilot made two attempts, but withdrew both times. On his third and final attempt, the unpredictability of the turbulence and air cushion led him to smash his canopy into the trapeze, causing his helmet and mask to be ripped off his face. With expert control, Shock guided the Goblin back down to the dry lake bed and belly landed the plane using its fixed skids. Following this incident, all testing was suspended while modifications and repairs were made to the Goblin. 
Schock took this time to practice the recovery of the aircraft using the trapeze and hook system. In mid-October, they were once again ready for testing. Two more captive carry flights later, and they were ready to release the Goblin. This time, the docking procedure was a success. Schock was able to secure the little Goblin to the trapeze after a few attempts. Though they weren't in the clear yet, this successful docking procedure gave hope that the Little Goblin project might just be successful. The XF-85 had proven itself to be quite maneuverable and easy to fly. Its top speed had fallen short of expectation, but other than that and the retrieval system, the prognosis looked good. Unfortunately, on its next flight it failed to be retrieved once again. Shock made four attempts before finally latching onto the trapeze only for the hook to break and dislodge. He successfully belly landed the aircraft once again. The remaining two test flights ended unsuccessfully. The test pilot was unable to latch the hook onto the trapeze and had to belly land both times. This would ultimately lead to the demise of the Goblin. In the end, the Goblin's lack of performance and difficulties with its trapeze and hook system led to the cancellation of the program. McDonnell proceeded with new designs for a better, faster Parasite Fighter to replace it. However, the real nail in the coffin of the Parasite Fighter was the advancement of aerial refueling. Though it wasn't a new concept, it had been dangerous and questionable at the time. The debate of aerial refueling versus flying aircraft carrier had been put to bed with the introduction of the Boeing KB-29P. Again, a modified B-29 Superfortress. Though the requirements to dock and successfully refuel were tasking on the pilot, they were deemed much simpler still than the aerial docking of the Goblin. Now just a footnote in aviation history, the Little Goblin could have been the start of an entire generation of parasite fighters. A formation of heavy bombers carrying their own backup ready to deploy in a moment's notice and then be recaptured to continue on mission. Perhaps if the engineering and aerodynamics of the trapeze system had been corrected, the dream of flying aircraft carriers would have become a reality.